Hello and welcome to Global Health TV. On today's show, we have exclusive interviews from the American Public Health Association's 150th annual meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. We'll be discussing law, ethics and global health with Larry Gostin and Paul Reed, US Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health, diagnoses the social determinants of health. Expert in global health law, Professor Larry Gostin works with the Biden administration, the World Health Organization and the World Bank on pandemic response. My colleague Audrey Gottfried met with Professor Gostin to hear his perspective on the role of law in health crisis. Well, from SARS to COVID-19, there have been no shortage of public health emergencies over the last several years. But how should we respond to those public health emergencies from a legal perspective? Joining me now here in studio is Georgetown University professor Larry Gostin, hopefully to answer that exact question. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Let's go back a little bit and start off with public health law and ethics and how that came into existence in the first place. Yeah, let's start with ethics. You know, we you know, we have a history in America of focusing on the common good, what we owe to each other. And we've seen that right through our history when we would, with smallpox vaccinations um, through to um, save food and clean water. Um, and we have this rich tradition that went through JFK, you know, ask not what uh, you, know, you can do for your country. Exactly. Yes. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Great Society, the War on Poverty. Um, and yet today, we've lost that tradition of the common good. And we're all, all about what, what are my rights? Me, me, me. Uh, me. And not what, what do I owe to my family, to my country, my community, to my world. And the law has reflected that, um, whereby originally we have had a huge understanding in the judiciary of the need for strong public health powers. And fast forward to the current Supreme Court, that is just eviscerating our ability to protect health, safety, the environment, um, and even you know, issues like reproductive health and abortion. Right. Were you surprised by the Supreme Court's decision regarding Roe v. Wade, the fact that they waded into that in the first place? Uh, the very sad truth is with this empowered, super conservative majority, their, their decisions are almost predictable. And they've really decided to own all of the most contentious issues in America. If you think about it, abortion, race, climate change, firearms, the list goes on and on and on. And they really are, you know, destroying what we are as a nation, you know, about the idea that we, we're in this together and we've got, we need to protect one another. We need to look out for one another. The court doesn't seem to get that. Obviously that decision by the high court had a huge impact on public health. Are there any other cases that stick out to you with regard to having a large public health impact? I would name a few. I mean, certainly firearms. Um, you know, we have you know, tens of thousands of people dying of firearms every year in the United States more. Um, and for most of our nation's history, um, we didn't regard the Second Amendment as something that applied to an individual right. And now um, the court is really diminished, if not destroyed, our ability to, to enact sensible firearm safety. I would also, on issues of public health and climate change, um, really saying that um, public health agencies, particularly federal agencies like OSHA, EPA, CDC, um, don't have those kinds of powers. And, and, the, and the upcoming term, I think, on the, on the ballot is affirmative action. Um, and it's not just college admissions. It also is about, you know, our ability to take race into account in, in, in vaccination allocation and other kind of measures of equity. So we're really threatened by this current Supreme Court, in my view. 
You mentioned vaccines. You know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of different states or localities imposed what some would describe as very uh, harsh restrictions with regard to masking, uh, requiring vaccinations in order for people to go back to their place of employment so that they can continue their jobs. Do you think that some of those restrictions were uh, overstepped their boundaries a little bit or they were, were they well within the law? After 9-11 and we had anthrax attacks and the CDC asked me to dra draft the model state public health emergency law. And I, I anticipated virtually everything that happened during COVID in terms of masking, compulsory vaccinations, quarantines, all of that was accepted. I never in my wildest dreams could imagine that New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, would be locked down, mm -hmm. or it, let alone Delhi and Beijing. Right, right. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I think school closures were an overreach um, to the extent that they were there. Um, but by and large, um, public health needs strong, vibrant powers. It, and that includes, first and foremost, um, vaccination, including compulsory vaccination. We've eliminated, you know, you know, dreaded diseases like, you know, measles, um, uh, chicken pox, um, uh, rubella, a whole range of things that used to be scourges in our society. And we have these modern miracles of COVID vaccines. Um, and yet too many people are dying needlessly. Um, it's preventable. Um, and so I think there is a role for strong, robust public health powers. We're seeing, though, with regard to some of the compulsory vaccinations so that you can, you know, return to your workplace, people who did not want to get vaccinated have filed suit. I believe oh, it was, yeah. forgive me if I'm wrong, but New York City or somewhere in New York, New York State, um, where they are winning. So the law is on the side of the people and their individual decisions. Do you anticipate that changing as we move forward? That's the big problem. I mean, since uh, Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905, the courts have consistently recognized public health powers, um, sometimes called police powers, um, because we need a strong public health agencies to protect the common good. But that's unraveling with you know, the modern judiciary. You know, Donald Trump has appointed one out, out of every four judges in America and one third of the Supreme Court. Um, and it's really changed. We've, we, they're slashing precedent, just doing away with it. We saw it with Roe versus Wade. We've seen it with firearms. And we see it with COVID, um, vaccinations, masking, and other kinds of things. I wrote an article in the Washington Post about uh, the decision by a single Florida judge um, to strike down the CDC mask mandate in airports and and plans one Florida judge appointed by Donald Trump, who the American Bar Association said was unqualified. And if CDC can't require a mask on a plane in the middle of a pandemic, I'm not sure what CDC could require. And so we're in dangerous territory, we really are. Larry, I could have talked to you all day long, but we do have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time today. I sure do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Next, Paul Reed, U.S. Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health, discusses the path to health equity and tackling the social determinants of health with Autry in Boston. Thanks, Stephen. Social determinants play a huge role in the overall health of the general public. If healthy food, clean water, and preventative health care isn't accessible to all, then we will never become the healthiest nation. Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Dr. Paul Reed, discusses the initiative Healthy People 2030. Thanks for your time this morning. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit about what you feel are some of the most pressing public health issues at the moment and how your office is working to tackle those. Loaded question. That is a loaded <laughs> question. Well, frankly, I think it's what it's always been or has been for many decades now, and that is the burden of chronic disease we know in this country. Uh, I know that sounds strange at a time of a pandemic, at a time when substance use disorder and overdoses are 
at a peak, um, and many other public health related issues are ongoing. But if you really take it in total, um, if you really look hard at the data that, you know, in terms of where the greatest burden of diseases in terms of morbidity, illness, hospitalization rates, as well as deaths in this country, it undoubtedly has to, we can't avoid talking about chronic disease. In light of COVID-19, I think it's probably also the greatest lesson that we're going to end up taking away. Granted, there's going to be a lot of lessons learned from the pandemic, but um, we know for certain that, unfortunately, our greatest vulnerability going into the pandemic was our baseline morbidity. Um, the amount of disease in terms of overweight and obesity, diabetes and hypertension undoubtedly has led to the vast majority of hospitalizations, serious illness with COVID and regrettably deaths. So I don't think we can get away with being as complacent about dealing with chronic disease um, as we have. And we're not. We're moving very rapidly in the direction of doing something about that, as evidenced by the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition and Health, which was heavily um, focused on issues related to mitigating chronic disease over the long term. You know, the theme of this year's annual meeting is leading the path toward equity. What has your office done to try to create a healthier nation, leading the path toward health equity and also addressing some of those health disparities? Well, one thing we've done, um, probably most importantly, is deal with, grapple with the definition of health equity. Um, health equity as a term, health disparities, they're used very differently, very widely. Um, and I think it behooves us to come to a common understanding of what we mean by health equity and disparities. Um, to that end, um, in this past year, we executed a um, landscape analysis of um, the use of those terms, both in public and private um, uh, areas government of all sizes, including the federal government. Um, and we produced a report, um, which is available on our website. Um, I encourage people to go to that. It's Health Equity in Healthy People 2030 is the way to reach that if you Google. Um, and it, that kind of sets the groundwork for us understanding in a common way what we're talking about when we say health equity. That's going to then help us move forward in addressing it. For our office in particular, health equity permeates everything we do, um, from the physical activity guidelines for Americans to the dietary guidelines for Americans, and of course, healthy people. Um, healthy people in its 40 year plus legacy um, has incorporated elements of health equity um, each and every decade. This decade, far more so than ever before. Um, and that's particularly borne out in the way the social determinants of health are reflected in the work that's um, presented in healthy people. The objectives, the data, the resources tied to them, et cetera. And you're, I want to talk specifically about that. How exactly does healthy people and the social determinants of health address some of those disparities? Well, it, it's largely in the data now. Um, so like never before, we've got um, population based data that allows us to see disparities much more so than ever before. Uh, and that's true for a variety of different types of objectives. It's particularly true for the objectives related to the social determinants of health. Uh, as people start to use Healthy People 2030 and delve into the data that is now more visually well presented than ever before, public health workers, lay public, they're going to be able to see what's evident there um, in terms of where those disparities lie and to some degree why. What types of resources do you offer policymakers and researchers to try to help move the needle on some of these very important topics? At its most basic level, and we have evidence-based resources, which, what we call them, EBRs, um, and they're baked into healthy people across the board. Um, they're tied to objectives. They're also categorized into kind of intuitive um, topic areas. They're readily referenceable. Um, good example would be um, in the topic area of housing and how it might relate to social determinants and um, offering opportunity for health. Um, you can track to a resource um, from Community Commons um, that speaks to um, housing first as an uh, initiative to um, improve upon homelessness. What are some of the efforts that we can look forward to seeing your office um, you know, lead in the next few years? Quite a bit. Um, <laughs> your plate uh, is full. <laughs> yeah, it is more, it's overflowing. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're in this, this five-year cycle of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, our office leads. We co-lead it with the USDA, but we have uh, the predominant role to play in, in administering that. And that includes the Scientific Advisory Committee, which is currently being seated. And we're just starting off the scientific review process coming into FY or calendar year 23. That's a good example. In terms of Healthy People 2030 in particular, we're going to be advancing the data that is incorporated into it. We're going to be um, adding two objectives as um, the work groups and the public deem appropriate. We're actually currently going through a public comment period on a new objective related to uh, voting participation as an indicator for health. Um, that's another very um, prominent 
public health issue these days, um, civic participation. And then uh, for a couple of years now, we've had the role of um, executive leadership, stewardship, if you will, of what we refer to as the Equitable Long-Term Recovery and Resilience Plan, which is more than a public health initiative. It's really a whole of government initiative that's intended to help bring our partners from sectors outside of public health, like transportation, housing, education, very diverse sectors, not just in government, but um, sectors in, uh, outside of government as well, all to this common, more broad in interpretation of the social determinants of health, which we're now leveraging as uh, the vital conditions for health and well-being, a much more inclusive um, approach to thinking about those life circumstances that implicate our well-being. You mentioned how broad the social determinants of health are. Can we narrow that down a little bit? If, is there a way that you can list maybe some of the social determinants that we need to work on to eliminate so that we can try to eliminate health disparities? Sure, well, so the social determinants health framework it has five major components to it. Um, one example would be healthcare quality and access. That's one that we think about a lot. In fact, if you look at it, it our healthcare system as a whole, our, it's the lion's share of the focus that um, we pay to social determinants. It's really on accessing healthcare properly. I would argue strongly that that's probably the least of the five that we ought to be paying most attention to. We ought to be looking at housing. We ought to be looking at education. We ought to be directing our attention to where people live, learn, work, play, worship, and age, like we like to say, because that's where we find health. Um, we go to the healthcare system to get healthy, but we find health in the places where we live. That's interesting, and I would think that you could probably have the fastest impact in those arenas rather than trying to tackle the big albatross that is the healthcare yes. system. Yes, especially turning a large healthcare system on its ear, mm -hmm. which I think is what it's going to take to make things right from an um, advancing health perspective. Whereas if we can improve upon education, we can uh, improve upon health literacy through our education systems. We can improve upon the quality of homes that people live in and the environments where they're able to walk around, um, where they find healthy nutrition. That is a paramount one, hence the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Um, those are the issues that are ultimately going to garner us the health we need. Here we think about creating the healthiest nation, but obviously we want a healthy world. Um, could the models developed in healthy people, you think, be used globally to create health equity all around the world? By all means. In fact, they are. Healthy people is leverage in countries um, all around the world, um, some, some more overtly than others. Um, but certainly the underlying tenets that are, that are baked into healthy people, not the least of which is the social determinants of health framework, is spoken to and, and um, is addressed through policymaking uh, everywhere. WHO, the UN, had a recent conversation with uh, FAO, a part of the UN that deals with food and agriculture, um, and they very much subscribe to these tenants as well. Awesome. All right, Dr. Paul Reed, thank you so much for all that you do, and thank you for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Next time, Global Health TV looks at the impact of climate change and health at the American Geophysical Union Fall meeting in Chicago. You're not going to want to miss that. So, But until then... It's goodbye.